question uh, regarding multiverse. Assuming that uh, we have enough time to travel between different universes, could, would it be possible or there would be maybe some space, di uh, barrier of different space? Um, well, uh, uh, most people say it would never be possible to travel to but another of these uh, space Assuming times. that we have time or that yes. we can pass, pass by the yes. speed of light. Well, well, just Even then there might be limits, because uh, it's true that in principle we could, uh, if we could go very close to the speed of light, we could get to the very distant galaxies I showed you. We could do that, but there are probably in our own universe, beyond our horizon, galaxies which we could never reach. Um, and that's even more true if we talk about the aftermath of other big bangs. It may be a separate region, so um, almost certainly um, uh, there's no technology we can envisage which could uh, get us to these other domains. And as I say, although we could in principle go to a distant galaxy, if we go close to the speed of light, there are even in our own uh, universe, um, there are galaxies so far away we could never reach them. Uh, Robin Catchpole, I'd, I'd like to ask Martin, what are the laws that we can still go on using in the multiverse? What principles of physics do we retain? Um, well, again, I'm not an expert, and I think that is one of the, one of the key questions. I mean, uh, there, may be, uh, there may be some bedrock laws which apply everywhere, and some which are uh, relatively pro parochial. I mean, there's a nice analogy which um, Paul Davis gave in one of his books, which is uh, uh, based on snowflakes. If you look at snowflakes, then, of course, they all look distinctive, because their pattern depends on the uh, environment, the, the humidity and temperature of the cloud they fell through when they formed. But they all have hexagonal symmetry, because that's a feature of the water molecule. So in, the, in snowflakes, um, the uh, hexagonal symmetry is a sort of bedrock feature of them all, whereas the pattern is an environmental accident, as it were. And that may be an analogy with the situation here. Uh, if you imagine different big bangs, then there may be some uh, features which are common to them all, but there may be other features of symmetry breakings, etc., which may happen differently. So some of the laws may be bedrock universal, others may be parochial bylaws in our cosmic patch, as it were. But of course, that's a, a, a program for the future. We just don't know uh, how it'll pan out. But of course, we do know that uh, uh, s among some string theorists, um, it's common to suspect that there are many different vacuum states. Rather than just one, that means different values for lambda and maybe different uh, microphysics in the different states. That's an idea, but all this is speculative. And I should really give the health warning again that uh, everything I said about the universe before uh, 10 to the minus 9 seconds is very speculative, although slightly less so than it was before 4 o'clock today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, Ulana Gumiuk uh, had a question. Uh, presuming that what we know about the laws within our universe, can there be some sort of um, an accident or cr creative accident that can suddenly change all the laws within our own universe and obviously shift the way it might happen with multiverses? Um, well, we don't know, but there have been ideas. Um, in fact, there were some people who thought that uh, we should be careful turning on a, uh, the accelerator in Geneva because if it achieved conditions never achieved before, then some people thought it might sort of uh, create a black hole or rip apart the fabric of space and uh, do something catastrophic like that. Uh, so there have been ideas in the past uh, that uh, would uh, say that um, our, um, uh, our space may be so-called metastable, rather like uh, if you have a very pure tank of water, you can cool it below freezing point and no ice crystals form, and then you put a little grain into it, it suddenly all freezes. And that happens. And so there were some people who thought that our universe could be like that, in that the uh, um, s state of, uh, of our space is not the lowest possible state, and it could be triggered by some uh, um, tweaking, as it were, into a lower state. That's a possibility, but uh, uh, I, I would say that's thought rather unlikely. Um. Um, Isam Kurbaj. Um, now, I am actually intrigued by the picture you were showing, the relationship between the stars and the planets and the way how they are uh, relating to each other. What happened to the planets when the stars are dying? Ah, 
um, when, 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 when the sun dies, um, then uh, a lot of the sun's material will blow out and it'll get very hot. So uh, we, we think that the inner planets, uh, Mercury and Venus, will be engulfed. The Earth will not be completely engulfed by the debris, but it'll get very hot and the Earth will be uninhabitable. Um, and so uh, when we look at those um, stars which have died and exploded, then we of course do wonder uh, were there any people living on planets around those stars uh, who uh, may be there no longer. Um, and, but I think uh, um, if we think about the, the future um, of uh, uh, life on this Earth, then the end of our Sun is five or six billion years away. And that's longer than the time it's taken us to evolve from the very first organisms. And so uh, any creatures that witness the death of the Sun will have, we, we have to worry about it. They won't be humans, they'll be as different from us as we are from a bacteria, um, because there's been lots of time for evolution. And so uh, they may have solved the problem of how to escape. Mm -hmm. John, we expect answers, not questions from you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I, I just can't resist commenting that uh, the experiments that we do at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN are just experiments that nature has been doing you know, for billions of years. Uh, we're just reproducing cosmic ray collisions. Mm. So yes. I, I don't think there's any way that uh, we could do anything dangerous. Oh, no. In fact, I wrote a paper on that 30 years ago just to, to reassure people on, on, <laughs> on that sort of thing. No, no I, th I think I just said there are some people who do worry, but I think they, uh, they can be reassured simply on those grounds that we know what's happened uh, in the cosmos where much more violent experiments have been done and are being done all the time. Yeah. I, I, so I think it is important to emphasize that these fears are totally groundless. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, just a very simple question from someone who does know almost nothing about physics, but as far as I know, uh, there is nothing that travels faster than light mm -hmm. in the universe. How robust is this idea within physics and how important is it, it is? I mean, I just was wondering why it is so important to suppose this. And if it could be one day, maybe, uh, I mean, refuted. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's a robust idea, but sometimes it's overinterpreted because uh, um, if you move very fast and close to the speed of light, then we've known for a hundred years that you can uh, travel um, a, a billion light years in your lifetime. Um, so. Uh, it depends on what clock you use. So um, it's true that you can't travel faster than light uh, measured by a clock that's at rest, but one has to be careful applying that simple dictum uh, in uh, more general cases and also when you have black holes, etc. So uh, the uh, ideas that I discussed are all consistent with the idea that the speed of light measured locally is a speed limit, but it does allow um, causal contact to uh, seemingly travel faster than light. There's no contradiction, but remember that uh, the speed of light limit is only straightforward um, when you make a local measurement and it's in special relativity. So the simple answer is that we haven't found a way around. There are ideas you might be thinking of, a sort of time warps and going into a black hole and coming out somewhere else, um, and um, those are in principle uh, uh, possible, um, but uh, technically not possible. Thank you very much. Um, so I suppose uh, with today's news, uh, with what looks like strong support for inflation, it's a happy St. Patrick's Day for everybody. <laughs> but uh, my question is, in terms of the multiverse, I mean, are there perfectly, would you say, are there perfectly respectable theories of inflation that don't lead you to the multiverse? Or is it more, yes. do you think we're kind of stuck with this idea now and it's going to take a while? Um, I think th there, are, there are some, especially promoted by Linde, that do lead naturally to a multiverse. There are some that don't. And then, as I say, even if we have a multiverse, then it's a separate question uh, whether we have to believe that there are many, many different vacuum states, like Susskind and people say in their popular books, or whether there will be a unique uh, state. So I think those are still um, uh, complete uncertainties, and we don't have a firm enough theory. But as I say, there are um, uh, specific models uh, which allow eternal inflation and those which don't. And there are also specific models that allow many different vacuums and those which don't. So I, I would just say this is 
22nd century, I hope it's not uh, well, 21st century physics and maybe even 22nd century physics. Yeah, okay, I have two standard questions from a critic. First is, how can you test theories of the multiverse? And the second question is, can the multiverse explain anything? Um, this is important because um, when people claim that the multiverse is plausible, this mm. is actually a, a logical fallacy because even if certain things are plausible, provided that the multiverse is, uh, is a true speculation, this doesn't make the speculation about the multiverse more plausible. No, I agree with that. But, but uh, as regards your first question, um, uh, I think um, we've got to wait till we have a uh, physical theory which applies at, say, 10 to 16 GeV, some sort of unified theory. If we have a theory that applies at those temperatures and which is corroborated by observations we can make, if it explains things about neutrinos and some of the 19 numbers and things like that, and thereby gains credibility, then if it predicts, say, Linde's eternal inflation, we take that prediction seriously. I think it's very important that we don't need to be able to test every consequence of a theory. We need to be able to test enough consequences to gain confidence in the theory, and then we believe other consequences. In the case of Einstein's general relativity, for instance, uh, we've tested it in many ways, and therefore we believe what it says about the insides of black holes, even though we can't observe there. And if we get to the stage where we have a theory of physical tensor 16 GeV, which predicts and accounts for things that we can observe in the lab or in nature, then it'll gain credibility. And then if it were to tell us that there are many big bangs, we should take that prediction seriously. But we're far from that. But that's, that's the way the argument would go. It'll, uh, I'm saying that um, at the moment it is speculation, but we don't know the physics. But if we knew the physics, then we would know whether that physics does have as a consequence the existence of these extra domains. It would also be possible for a, a multiverse theory to predict that every universe within it had a, must have a particular property. And in that case, if we didn't find that property in our universe, we would falsify the multiverse theory. So mm -hmm. we don't have to see the other universes yeah, to rule point. the theory out, mm. because it might say something bad about every universe, I including ours. Yeah. Mm -hmm. OK, well, I think it's time to thank Martin again and to lead him to go back to his universe. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Okay. <laughs>